thank you for joining today. Um, it's good to see some prior students, good to see some current students. Uh, look forward to other folks becoming future students. Um, welcome to a discussion about macroeconomics and real estate um, and 1929 and today. So this is the relaunch of our weekly faculty seminar series where Shaq's faculty through its diversity will actually talk about a number of really important issues in the industry as it currently exists. And, um, and I'm honored to be able to lead that off. And I want today to keep this relatively brief to give you the opportunity to type questions in. Um, as well as to do what I usually do, which is talk my book. This is why, as I joked, prior students could give this talk for me because they pretty much know what I'm going to say. So this is who I am. I'm the faculty director of our new CREFC Center for Real Estate Finance. I'm the faculty coordinator of our data analytics concentration, and I am a distinguished fellow of the NAOP Research Foundation. So I wanna take us back in time. It can be a little bit daunting when we think today about uh, how much data we generate, data that is essentially the digital exhaust of human activity, because we generate more data in one day today than we generated in one year, 10 years ago, largely because of the advent of the iPhone. And this seems like a very different world, but um, in some ways, uh, we 10 years ago looked as antiquated today as 1929 looks today. So let me talk a little bit about economic history. In 1907 in the US, there was a large economic contraction. Uh, what, we didn't have a lot of data, but arguably it was one of the largest economic contractions that had occurred since the end of World War II, uh, since the end of the Civil War in the US. And this economic contraction arose uh, in New York, uh, what we would understand then to be Wall Street, what we now call Wall Street today, and there were about seven individuals who got together in the house of JP Morgan on Fifth Avenue to figure out how to become lenders of last resort to the industry in order to create confidence that uh, the financial uh, system was functioning properly at the time. And at that point, there was a recognition finally in the US that the US needed a central bank, which it had not had since the abolition of our original central bank under Hamilton. And so in 1913, the US passed something called the Federal Reserve Act. It created the US Federal Reserve, a decentralized central bank with the primary function of acting as the lender of last resort to the banking industry, of following Walter Badgett's uh, advice that the role of a central bank essentially was to lend at a discount against good collateral. And, and in 1913, the act was signed. Slowly, uh, the Federal Reserve System was created with the decentralized structure of the various Federal Reserve banks. So the Bank of New York or uh, the Bank of San Francisco. The 1907 financial crisis or the 1907 depression was actually arguably created by the 1906 earthquake in San Francisco, a topic I also talk about in class. So slowly, the Federal Reserve System is created. At the time, monetary policy largely was viewed not in its current form, where the monetary authority buys and sells short-term instruments in order to affect short-term rates, and through the theories we teach at Shack, impact long-term rates. 
Rather, it was to act as a lender of last resort against good collateral, but at a discount. Hence the word discount window, if you've ever heard that phrase. And then we had the roaring, well, I mean, uh, World War I, we then had the, what we call the ro roaring 1920s. Uh, individuals in the US had gotten accustomed to investing in things like bonds and stocks during World War I. As the federal government needed to raise money for the war, it would issue uh, debt. And households became accustomed to buying those sorts of ins instruments, both debt and equity. And, and there was a period of, of broad prosperity in the 1920s called the Roaring Twenties. And we approached the end of that decade in 1929 with economist Irvin, Irving Fisher of Yale saying that the valuation of stocks at that time, uh, the valuation of markets was justified by the so-called economic fundamentals. And then as we entered the fall of 1929, we would see a staggering decline in aggregate indices of stock markets. Let's just call it the stock market. On October 24th, 1929, the stock market declined by 11%. October 25th, Black Friday, declined by another 11%. October 28th, down 13%. October 29th, down 12%. And between 1930 and 1932, the aggregate decline of the stock market would be over 40%. And this ushered in the Great Depression. And if you look back at that time period, policymakers had little or no data. The Great Depression was essentially the justification for beginning to create something we now call the National Income and Product Accounts, NIPA. When you hear figures quoted, you know, GDP changes, investment changes, consumption changes, they didn't have those measures in 1929. It was only through the creation of the national income and project accounts that we would have those data. And that wouldn't occur until the mid 1930s in the US. At that time, we created something called the Cowles Commission on Economic Research. And this group of individuals began to develop what we would now call data science in macroeconomics. They would begin to develop, even at that time, this is almost pre-computer, um, what we consider to be macroeconometric models for policymaking. That is models that have data, they have theory, they attempt to me essentially marry the two in order to engage in policymaking. And this was a Herculean task at the time. If you think about how data were stored and the computational power we had available to us. And for reason I, reasons I talk about in, in my data class, this exercise broke down. It didn't work out very well. We learned a lot. Um, and we've moved in a different direction along the lines of microeconomic approaches, natural experiments, randomized control trials, uh, the gold standard of micro, micro econometrics, which is algorithmic counterfactuals. And indeed the Fed, the Federal Reserve as it's currently constructed, now relies on real time data to gauge economic activity. They get <clears throat> data feeds from Visa and MasterCard for real-time measures of consumption. And they are able to gauge the impact of things like COVID in real time. <clears throat> Why does this matter for real estate? Real estate was actually uh, faced with tech disruption before COVID-19. Uh, I've done a lot of research in this area did a lot of research in this area when I was at CBRE. And commercial real estate was being impacted by technological disruption. The big brokerage houses don't usually like to talk about this, but it's true. Um, agglomeration economics was driving 
or further urbanization and density because of the benefits that you and I get of being together. Benefits that accrue over time and might be slightly stressed by COVID and of course our recent blizzard, but the benefits we get from agglomeration economics, chatting with each other over coffee to exchange ideas are difficult to disrupt because 40% of the US population lives on 2% of the land. And the counterfactual there would basically be that we all are uniformly distributed across the land and we aren't. Then there's Amazon and e-commerce. If you think about a company that has uh, had a continual impact on commercial real estate, it's Amazon and e-commerce more broadly. Obviously it's uh, dramatically and adversely impacted the performance of brick and mortar retail. It has greatly benefited the performance of industrial space because Amazon needs these fulfillment centers and, and distributional efficiency or dis distributional speed to basically get you the stuff that you've ordered in less than a day. And then finally, co-working uh, and, and we work. Um, I make this argument in class all the time. WeWork's failure was not the business model. Co-working makes a great deal of sense. And in fact, having distributed spaces we can see has value that's called optionality in space markets. And there are benefits uh, to both tenants and landlords for that optionality. So think about commercial real estate as it might have existed 20 years ago. It was a tenant signing a 10 year lease, paying a monthly rent to a landlord who would show up in you know, year 9.5 and say, do you want to renew or not? That looks like bond pricing. As we move toward um, this structure of co-working, co-working facilities can price in real time. And that looks much more like equity pricing than it does like bond pricing. Again, with both uh, tenant and landlord benefiting from the optionality of space. All of these existed before COVID. And I would argue that COVID will accelerate both e-commerce and co-working. And when we are beyond this, as we have two widely distributed uh, vaccines that are highly efficacious and ideally a third, we will get back to agglomeration driving global urbanization. As I said, you know, COVID will accelerate this stuff. And we need to face the fact in commercial real estate, we don't have very good data. When I was at CBRE, I, I used to joke with clients that I had 160 observations to help you allocate billions. And what do I mean by that? Uh, one of the most accurate measures of net effective rents is something called the Torto Wheaton Rent Index, created by Ray Torto and Bill Wheaton and their research group. It essentially hoovers in a lot of data from CBRE. And as a result, it can calculate a net effective rent through uh, the ideas I talk about in my data class. And that is a very, very accurate measure of net effective rents. But this index in gateway markets has existed for only about 40 years. And it's a quarterly measure. So four times 40 is 160 observations. And folks like you know, large private equity firms are deploying billions of dollars of capital based on 160 observations historical observations, and then uh, 
uh, a somewhat clunky forecasting model um, that econometric ad advisors uses to predict or forecast where rents are going to go. So the industry today looks like bond trading in the 1970s before there was uh, a lot of information available, before there were a lot of um, ways that people engage in bond pricing based on theory. And that's fine until unexpected inflation arrives. And that's what happened in the 1970s when traditional bond pricing begins to break down. And COVID is the unexpected inflation for commercial real estate. So let's talk a bit about the current US economic cycle here. I'm going to speed things up. I want to walk through some relevant empirical regularities. This is the 10 year US Treasury going back to uh, 1990. Long duration rates in the US have been falling for a very long time. And this is relevant because arguably the 10 year US Treasury is the opportunity cost of capital for commercial real estate. As, that, as the opportunity cost of capital declines, we would expect more capital to be deployed in commercial real estate, but we don't have the techniques that our friends in equity trading have, right? They're looking at data, uh, they're looking at ticker data that could exist at a nanosecond level. And the best we have is a quarterly vacancy measure. So long duration rates have been falling, opportunity cost capital for the industry has been falling. Um, that suggests essentially that the demand should go up. Given a fixed supply, that will tend to push up prices, push up values for buildings. Another very important um, idea is that long and short-term rates have decoupled. There used to be much stronger correlation between longer-term rates and shorter-term rates. This is a graph, again, of the 10-year US Treasury with two short-term rates uh, graphed here as well, one year, three month. Let's look at the 10 year and the three month, two of the most liquid uh, bond markets in the world. And looking at this, you don't need to deploy any data analytics to say, boy, this correlation seems to have broken down, especially if we look at it over time. Um, if you go back to the early 1990s, there was a much stronger correlation pattern than that which prevailed after the global financial crisis. <clears throat> and this is important from the perspective of policymaking because um, the way we engaged in policymaking before, or monetary policy before the global financial crisis was to have the Federal Reserve buy and sell short-term interest rates with the idea that, that, that buying and selling would affect long-term rates and affecting long-term rates in turn affects the real economy. If long-term rates rise, that lowers uh, internal rates of return, which essentially reduces uh, investment, et cetera, et cetera. So just looking at this, long and short-term rates have decoupled. Long-term rates are coming down they're determined in global markets and long and short-term interest rates have become decoupled. And cap rates, a measure of value, arguably in the industry are falling as well. This is cap rates by asset class, multifamily is in black, uh, industrial is in green, retail is in blue, which I shouldn't have to tell you. Looking at this chart, these data from our friends at Real Capital Analytics excludes uh, any COVID period because uh, the volume of transactions has been very sparse during the global financial crisis. So those are three key empirical regularities for commercial real estate. Long duration rates are falling, short and long-term rates have become decoupled, but cap rates as a measure of value have been declining. The implication of which is that value, the value of the physical built space has increased during this period of time. But I wanna 
hone in a bit. There is a there is a suggestion out there that the U.S. economy was on a solid footing before the word COVID ever entered the le the lexicon, and that's fundamentally not true. This is uh, a yield curve. It's the difference between the ten-year and the three-month U.S. Treasuries. Uh, graphed out over a period of time. Uh, the horizontal line at zero indicates uh, anything above that horizontal line or is a positive yield curve, anything below it is a negative yield curve. And negative yield curves have presaged economic contractions for some period of time. It presaged the economic contraction associated with the dot-com bust in 2000, uh, certainly presaged the um, global financial crisis of 07, 09. And the yield curve actually was negative. I was teaching in August of 2019, teaching a um, course in real estate finance when the US yield curve went negative. So I argued to that class long before COVID that the US economy was not on sound footing. It was not in uh, solid shape. And this too can be reflected by market expectations of inflation. This is a measure, um, you can see all these data sources. These are pulled directly from something called the Federal Reserve Economic Database. This is essentially what's called the 10 year break even rate of inflation since 2000. This is the market's expectation of inflation 10 years from now. And you can see it essentially went to zero during the global financial crisis. It was well below the Fed's stated 2% target, which is why that black line is there. The Fed's 2% target well before COVID. And these are two key metrics that you should consider. We had a negative yield curve and we had inflation expectations that were well below uh, the Federal Reserve's stated uh, policy. This is a graph of GDP growth. Uh, standard to see this. You can see the contraction during the global financial crisis of 2009. You can really see the contraction in 2000 uh, as a result of COVID. The US economy today is three and a half percent smaller than it was a year ago. This has been a deep recession. So what happens? The Fed initially tried its old playbook, which is to lower the Fed funds rate, the overnight rate, short-term policy rates with the hope of impacting the real economy by lowering long-term yields. So this, is, this was the Fed's old playbook and it deployed this immediately. Interest rates now, policy rates now, overnight lending rates now are essentially at zero. And the Fed has said that they will stay at zero for an extended period of time. In turn, equity markets actually recovered fairly rapidly um, in the face of COVID. This is the Wilshire 5000. It's a very broad market index. This, it start, this series starts uh, January 2 of 2020. You can see the market decline in this measure as COVID entered the lexicon as, as the first cases in the United States emerged. And with it, what emerged is uncertainty in the correct sense of that word, uncertainty. The Fed steps in with its old playbook essentially says we're going to provide as much liquidity as the market can bear and equity markets recovered quickly. And there seems to be uh, a somewhat of a disconnect between how backward looking measures and forward looking measures uh, are playing out throughout the recovery. Volatility has receded but we have something called the paradox of thrift. This is a, this is a measure of consumption, a, a narrower measure, but a more timely measure. This measures uh, US consumption on things like restaurants and leisure activity. And this goes back to before the global financial crisis, but you can see that very deep dip that occurs um, 
as COVID emerges and the lockdowns are imposed. And this is relevant because while this measure doesn't quite comprise the entire uh, U.S. consumption level, in the U.S. economy, roughly two thirds of the U.S. economy, U.S. GDP is consumption. So this declined very rapidly. And this was a paradox of thrift. Again, driven by uncertainty. And I will argue that uncertainty to a first approximation is a lack of data. This is essentially employment growth. It contracted very dramatically, much, much more dramatically than it contracted in any of the prior uh, uh, economic recessions. And this continues. This is a measure of first time unemployment claims uh, going back to the beginning of January 2020. Claim, these are weekly measures. So on a weekly basis, as COVID emerged, uh, 7 million people claimed unemployment benefits for the first time. And this measure has been quite elevated since then. It's hovering in and around a million per month, uh, per week. During the global financial crisis, this measure stood at its worst week at 800,000 claims. And we're seeing week in and week out, the best week so-called in the US economy is worse than the worst week or weeks of the global financial crisis. Unemployment rates, I'm gonna move through these relatively rapidly. I'm gonna stop here and, and focus on this just momentarily. This is the labor force participation rate of all men and women uh, who are considered to be prime age. This is a, an important measure about the status of the labor market. So this is basically the rate at which people, you're, you're either employed or you're looking for a job. If you're not looking for a job, you're out of this measure. And you can see this, this I've, I've graphed this going back as far as the data allow me to go. In this case, 1960. The dramatic increase we saw in labor force participation rates was not surprisingly women entering the labor force. And it peaks um, in the 1990s. It begins to decline a bit because of demographics, an aging society, people retiring, but it has dropped dramatically in the COVID situation. And as I think about longer term potential damage to the US economy, it's this measure that worries me the most because there is the potential of a permanent scarring effect on the US labor force. As labor force participation rates are low, people are not getting the valuable skills in the marketplace, in, in, uh, in, labor for, in participating in labor markets. And so I worry about this. So implications. Implications here require that I talk about three people, Frank Knight, Walter Badgett, John Maynard Keynes. In parentheses, these are the dates, the years in which these folks died. Knight, Frank Knight, Chicago economist Frank Knight, for the first time sort of laid out a framework in which we could distinguish risk from uncertainty. And his basic Framework, I think, makes a lot of sense. He said, risk is something we can measure and uncertainty is something we cannot. Badgett, Walter Badgett, uh, in a book called Lombard Street, essentially lays out the traditional function of the central bank as the lender of last resort. And he explains that role uh, of, a, of the lender of last resort. And, and he is the one who uses the phrase, you lend with a penalty to good collateral, which is to say you lend it a discount. And then John Maynard Keynes, the, the economist who essentially created macroeconomics by studying the Great Depression and essentially saying, somebody has to do something. We, we are stuck in this high unemployment, low growth world and absent some form of intervention that cannot be monetary policy because we tried that, 
we need some other type of policy to uh, help restart the car was roughly his analogy. And that was fiscal policy. And the data reflect all of these folks ideas contributed to us. So investors remember night. This is total assets in money market funds um, going back to about 1990. You can see, so this is cash. This is essentially cash that investors have. You can see it peaked during the global financial crisis. The, that red line is the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers in 2008. And then through the expansion, uh, uh, investors drew down cash. They deployed it in longer term investments. And as COVID emerged, uh, investors moved heavily into cash. This is, a, this is a clear sign of the role that uncertainty currently plays, even with two efficacious vaccines in the in our current macroeconomic cycle. So investors remember night, Federal Reserve remembers budget. This is a measure of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. Again, Lehman Brothers in red. Historically, the Fed just bought and sold short-term debt, US debt, with the idea that it couldn't affect longer-term interest rates in that process. That first large expansion in their balance sheet was the debt of Lehman Brothers and of Bear Stearns, which was brought onto the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. These other subsequent increases you've seen, can see in this graph, are, that's what we call quantitative easing. This was Ben Bernanke's idea because short and long-term interest rates are decoupled to make policy. And this was roundly criticized at the time, but the Fed has run out of tools. So it remembers budget, which is to say the lender of last resort providing liquidity to markets. And the current Fed's balance sheet stands at over $7 trillion, that's with a T, as we entered the COVID crisis. And then the federal government remembers Keynes. This is a measure of total public debt. So this includes both the federal government and state governments, but total public debt in the US is a share of our total output. And this now sits at about 130%. Um, it'll come down a bit as, as the US economy expands over the next few years. But because we had run out of the ability for monetary policy to have real uh, impacts on the US economy, the Federal Reserve stepped in with things like the Pay, Payroll Protection Act, Paycheck Protection Act, and this is the role of monetary policy, uh, fiscal policy, excuse me. So 1929 and today, why do they look similar? Very simple, we've returned to an absence of data. This series is the series of daily US testing for COVID going back to when uh, we essentially began to do <clears throat> nationwide testing, uh, April 1st, 2020. And you can see each time we, we sort of expand and then we reach a period of many, many weeks in which the level of testing remains flat. There's no substantive growth. And then we go into a period of growth. But in fact, if you look at testing over <clears throat> the last two to three months, in fact, we, we are not expanding the incidence of testing for COVID in the US. And to reflect on the way Frank Knight asked us to think about risk and uncertainty, to a first order approximation, Uncertainty today is a lack of data. The lack of data driven by this. This measure should be much higher than it is. Even in the face of, even with having two candidate vaccines or having two vaccines rather and, and a third potential vaccine because the incidence of vaccination remains very low. <clears throat> 
we don't have a solid measure of the incidence prevalence of COVID in the US population. So my little bit of advocacy here, um, that measure needs to expand a great deal. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna take a sip of water now um, and you should feel free to ask questions through the chat feature. So one question is, how, did I see last week's New Yorker on the future of office? And do I have any comments on it? I have to admit, I didn't, I haven't seen it. Um, I can guess from the title, has the pandemic transformed the office forever? Um, and we'll go back and read it. And I'll, you know, if, if the questioner wants to shoot me an email um, to get a more substantive response, I'm happy to do that. I. I, I want to emphasize that co-working is with us. S set aside WeWork. Co-working is a technological innovation that has value for the industry because we know in, <laughs> we have an example of successful co-working in this industry. We just call them hotels. It's why they price on something called the average daily rate rather than a monthly net effective rent. My opinion is that WeWork was overvalued, not because of the idea, but because WeWork didn't really have any sort of barrier to entry. Any large owner or manager of space could do what WeWork was doing. So if you're Tishman or you're RxR, you can do what WeWork was doing. So there was no inherent competitive barrier to entry, in my opinion, to what WeWork was doing. And that's why I think its valuation was a bit high. Uh, I think it's, you know, and, and why the IPO ultimately was pulled. But the value is there for both tenant and landlord. COVID has forced us to begin to recognize that value, even as we so-called share the pain. Um, but this distributed idea through technology and more real-time pricing of space will actually, I think, bring more transparency to the industry. So, um, so if the questioner wants to just shoot me an email, I'll try to read the article in the next few days. Other questions, thoughts? So I'm just, I'm going to read off the questions one by one and then try to address them. Um, one question is, you know, where do I think real estate markets are going? If, if we think about say the cap rate in the short run valuations have been adversely impacted. And the implication there is that cap rates should have gone up. But when you look at the limited cap rate data um, that are being generated, they haven't moved much at all in the last year. And I think that's largely due to monetary policy. Monetary policy, because uh, cap rates are positively correlated to long-term treasuries and long-term treasuries have, have come down a lot in the global finance, uh, in the COVID crisis, that decline in the 10 year US treasury has absorbed um, movements in cap rates. So I do believe that 
measures of value and cap rates are somewhat divorced at the moment because there's just not a lot of price discovery going on. My guess is that performance will begin to um, improve over the next three to six months. And, and just by the way, I, I do forecasting uh, for NAOP and you can keep an eye out for where, where I think these things are actually going. Uh, I'm just reading the second question, uh, which is a question about history. It, it, so let me paraphrase the question. Um, comparing today and some time ago, uh, the question asked me for my view on the outlook and what idea of current events will likely change our behavior and consequently the commercial real estate market. I think that there will be longer term impacts of COVID. I think that it will continue to drive demand for industrial space because of e-commerce. Uh, I, I think e-commerce, the, the rate of growth of e-commerce has accelerated because of COVID. We've seen this in terms of brick and mortar retail, which has been very adversely hit. Um, in, so that's sort of industrial and retail, multifamily, you know, I live in a big multi-family, multi-story, a 60-story glass box. Um, I think there are roughly 700 doors in this glass box. Uh, and I chatted with the doorman yesterday when I was picking up one of my boxes. And I said, how many boxes are, are you all getting in on a daily basis? And he said, oh, about uh, 1,400 boxes a day. So roughly the 700 doors are getting two boxes a day and they don't have the storage facilities. So uh, e-commerce impacts multifamily um, as well. Um, I think hotels leisure generally will return as rapidly as we can deploy the vaccine. The worse we are at deploying the vaccine, the longer the damage to um, hospitality will be, um, and it, it ultimately, I think we need to recognize that we don't have very good data in this industry. It isn't granular enough. It isn't accurate enough, and it is not timely enough. And I think many of these new prop tech startups that are trying to address this pain point have the possibility of dramatically changing how we basically invest money. Uh, another question, my outlook on multifamily. Peter Linneman said that we are entering the fourth golden age because of the spread. Um, hadn't, I haven't read Peter's comments. Um, I, I, I remain, so I remain very bullish on industrial. I remain very bearish on retail. Um, I do believe multifamily will, has the possibility of doing well, because again, if you think about the structure of multifamily, you know, Rents are quoted on a monthly basis and, and people are signing one or two year leases. So they look much more like real time pricing. So rents can adjust, at least, you know, uh, net effective rents can adjust based on uh, that short term leasing structure. But we still have a lot of supply that's coming online in New York and other gateway markets. Um, and it's coming online perhaps not at a great time. So I think um, multifamily has the potential of performing well. I, I, I do think that uh, the COVID crisis has ended the so-called amenity wars where these luxury multifamily units 
um, competed with each other based on gyms and pools and various other things. And I do think we're going to see outsized performance um, in the non-class A multifamily space and what we call class B and class C, so-called workforce housing. I think those will tend to outperform uh, their, you know, a, a historic benchmark. Um, let's do this. Uh, another question. There are a lot of bears in. Uh, let me answer these in reverse order. Ah. Uh, are you worried about the stimulus being too small due to political constraints? And alternatively, are you worried about fiscal stimulus being too large and having uh, negative long term consequences? I, I'm much more worried that it's too small than too large. I do think that we are currently relying on the Federal Reserve as an unelected branch of government to do too much. Historically, monetary policy was not supposed to play this function. It, it, it was to act as a lender of last resort as Badgett uh, described it. Its goal was to say, look, we, we've entered a period where there is uncertainty. We're going to provide liquidity by making loans against good collateral, and that would provide liquidity. But you politicians have to sort out the fiscal side. And my concern is um, that's broken down a lot in the US over the last, say, 25 years. So, but generally, I'm more concerned that it's going to be too small than too large because of reasons that, that Keynes described. I think that once we're out of this, we can begin to think about how restructuring certain components of fiscal policy, policy should occur. I actually have advocated that the US government issue a very long dated debt instrument, a 50 to 100 year bond to begin to demonstrate um, to essentially create a sense of confidence in, in the US government's long-term outlook. Um, another question. There are a lot of bears in CMBS. Um, and am I contrarian? I think is uh, I think that's the fair um, fair representation of the question. I think commercial mortgage-backed securities were a great idea in helping to bring transparency to the industry, and we thought these were going to work really well. We thought by distributing risk among investors, investors could begin to match. Um, their risk tolerances. But because the underlying instrument, which is, you know, a building is so illiquid, I it was clear that the illiquidity risks were not being baked into CMBS, which is why I think largely they have not recovered. The CMBS market's only about a third the size today than it was in, in 2007. I continue to maintain that uh, the idea is a good one of providing liquidity and transparency to real estate in a way that it allows investors to, um, to invest in real estate, which has uh, a lot of features in terms of its risk and return that make it attractive for capital. I, I, What's clear is, is either individuals want to own the whole asset, meaning the whole building, rather than a tranche in a mortgage structure, or be involved in something more liquid like a real estate investment trust that you know trade in real time, that allow investors to have exposure to commercial real estate, but, but brings in the benefits of liquidity that CMBS did not. Uh, next question. 
So uh, reflecting on the fact that uh, much of the world is locked down because of COVID. Uh, just a general question about how, um, when I think, well, let me read it directly. How long do you think it will take for the world to get back on track globally? When do you think businesses will start to be confident enough to look at other countries' markets again? Um, here, so the, the macroeconomic forecast that I use that drives the space demand forecast that I publish was spot on on the macro in 2020. Uh, the colleague with whom I do this and I were spot on on our macro in 2020, uh, which gives me some confidence of our forecast currently. We think we're going to have the US economy, we think by this time next year, uh, will be about 4% larger than it was this year. And that bodes well. Recognizing some of the concerns I expressed, especially around labor force participation and the potential for scarring. Uh, and, <clears throat> but that's, that's a conditional macroeconomic forecast. It's conditional on us, ex you know, A, doing a better job on COVID testing and B, doing a better job on getting these vaccines into people's arms. And, you know, I, my, <clears throat> we seem to be accelerating the rate of vaccination, but our testing regime in the US at least, uh, I think is, is still relatively poor. The UK seems to be doing a good job in terms of rolling uh, vaccines out in the United Kingdom, places like France and Spain are starting to <clears throat> uh, evidence uh, poor rollouts. So all of those make uh, forecasting very difficult and that's the uncertainty component. So we, we, we will be using in the future something called a Bayesian model, which better captures uncertainty around forecasts. Um, but kind of thinking about the forecasting uncertainty, it's much, much larger now um, than it was say two years ago. Uh, another question, when do you think would be the first things in the real estate industry to recover from COVID? Let me start with a, a scenario, which is we do begin this process of vaccinating, let's call it a million people per day, that we reach a level of herd immunity, say by late summer, if that is true and, and people start to feel comfortable, I think we could see a rapid recovery in, um, in the leisure industry, in hotels and things like that. Because people, the savings rate currently is very high in the US relative to, the, relative to historical US savings rates, which means people have a lot of cash and with a substantial fiscal stimulus that could essentially uh, magnify those cash holdings. And I, I think people will begin to feel much more comfortable about dining out, going on vacation. If we can get a vaccination rate up to about a million people in the U S per day. So, all of the macroeconomic forecasting I do is conditional on mostly on that one idea. And, and I, I hope that, and this is just a, an expression of hope, I hope the FDA approves a third vaccine. 
Okay. Um, that takes us to the hour. Um, thank you for uh, showing up in the midst of a global pandemic and a blizzard. Um, feel free to email me. Uh, the slides live on an open source repository, so you'll always have access to them. Feel free to follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I talk a lot about macroeconomics and commercial real estate uh, and, uh, and a lot about the role of data, data quality, and the value of algorithms as they begin to um, transform the commercial real estate industry.